Hannah, how are we doing on corn, please? Oh, you're on mute. One more. <laughs> One more. Okay. Excellent. Hello, Mayor Peterson. How are you doing? Hi, Amy. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Good, good. It's good to see you. Nice to see you too. Thank you. It's my first DV meeting. Oh my goodness. It, it's it's my first one in a long time. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. And then we have our new human services director and, and everyone will be meeting her in just a moment, but, but it's her first meeting too. Oh, great. That's great. Thanks. Madam yeah. Chair, we do have quorum. All right, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Regional Domestic Violence Council meeting. Let's call the meeting to order. Uh, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on YouTube as a way for members to the pub of the public to participate. I will ask that you keep your microphones on mute when you are not speaking. For the purpose of the meeting minutes, I ask you state your name before any comments. For action items, we will be taking a roll call vote I will ask staff to call out the council names and then ask how you vote. We will now begin with introductions. And before we introduce ourselves, I'd like to introduce Kelly Williams as our new MAG Human Services Director. She comes with significant experience in human services and we look forward to working with you, Kelly. Would you like to offer a few comments, please? Mm -hmm. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I am looking forward to learning about uh, all of your work in domestic violence and in human services in general in the county. I have worked in public health for the greater part of 20 years. The last 10 years have been spent in state service. I most recently came from Access to accept this position. And I have a real love for public health and for this community. I'm born and raised here in the Valley, one of those rare people who hasn't left. And um, it's just a delight to be here with you all. This, I'm so excited to be a part of the MAG family. So thank you. Thank you, Kelly, very much. We look forward to a long and, and uh, fruitful uh, partnership with you and uh, MAG. Okay, now back to committee introductions. Please introduce yourself when Tina calls your name. Thank you, Madam Chair. Roll call begins. Um, Celeste Adams. Zach Altman. I'm here, also born and raised. <laughs> Thank you. Council member uh, Lupe uh, Bandon. She's here, but she was on mute. Okay. Thank you. I'm here since 1848. <laughs> <laughs> Thank 1848. you, council member. Thank you. Um, let's see, Camp, uh, council member Christine Ellis. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, Dolores DC Ernst, vice chair. Person to the county board. Thank you. Council member Jerry uh, Fidel, Fidel. Here and present, thank you. Thank you. Laura Guild. Here. Thank you. Elizabeth Herbert. Here. Thank you. Samantha Hinchy. Here. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Clark. Marilyn Kusnick. Uh, here. Thank you. Andy Lefevre. Present, thank you. Thank you. Lieutenant Rick Lavis. Lavis. Okay. Rachel Mitchell. Okay. Council member Anita Norton. Present. And Amy Offenberg. I'm here. Thank you. Geraldo Pena. I'm here. Hello. Hey. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, Mayor Bridget Pier uh, Peterson. Hi, I'm here. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Chris Sharla. I'm here. Nice to Thank see you. everyone. Welcome. Um, Sergeant Kelly Shore. Melissa Thomas. 
Uh, Brandon Wilson. Here, thank you. Thank you. And Chris, uh, Aaron um, Yabu. Okay, you may proceed, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, do we have any members from the public? Present? No, okay. Uh, we'll move on to the call to the uh, audience. Please note that members of the public were given an opportunity to submit written comments relating to this meeting to azmag.gov slash comment within one hour of the posted start time for the meeting. Tina, has staff received any comments? There has been no comments, Madam Chair. Okay, all right. Then we will move on. And uh, we'll go to approval of the meeting minutes. Item three is approval of the meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve the minute meeting minutes? Uh, Madam Chair, this is Andy Lefevre. I move to approve the minutes. Is there a second? This is Brandon Wilson. I will second. Is there any discussion? Okay, please indicate your vote with a yay, nay, or abstention. Uh, Tina, will you please do a roll call vote? Thank you, Madam Chair. Celeste Adams, Zach Altman, Zach Altman, you're muted. Okay. Council Member Lupe uh, Bandon. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Council Member Tammy Caputi. Yes. Thank you. Council member Christine Ellis. Yes. Thank you. Vice chair Dolores DC Ernst. Yay. Council member Jerry um, Friedel. Yay. Thank you. Laura Guild. Yes. Thank you. Elizabeth Herbert. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Samantha Hinchy. Yay. Thank you. Um, Mary Lynn Kucinic? Uh, it's actually Kucinic, Mary Lynn Kucinic. Uh, oh, okay. Yes. Yay. Kucinic. Okay. Thank you. Eddie LaFever? Yay. Uh, Lieutenant Rick uh, Levis? Okay. Council Member Anita Norton? Yay. Thank you. Uh, Amy Offenberg? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Geraldo Pena? Yes. Thank you. Mayor Bridget Pe uh, Peterson? Yes. Thank you. Chris um, Sharla? Yes. Thank you. And Brandon Wilson? Yes. Thank you. You may proceed, Madam Chair. Thank you, Tina. The motion carries. Um, we're going to go on now to uh, an introduction of Laura Guild with DES to offer an update on this important partnership to address abuse of older adults. Um, and this is in regard to the United States Department of Justice Office of Violence Against Women, Arizona Abuse and Later Life Grant. Laura? Perfect. Thank you for that introduction. You just said a whole lot I don't have to say. Um, so thank you, everyone. I believe at the last meeting, uh, my colleague Nancy Parker gave a broad overview of the grant that we received in October of, of uh, when was it? What, what year is this now? And we've received it in October 2020. And this is a grant um, from the Office of Violence Against Women, specifically to address late life abuse. Our project, and Amy, are, uh, Jeremy, are the slides going? I guess they are, okay. Yes, they are, Laura. Thank you, thank you. Our, yes. our, our project specifically is titled Arizona Abuse in Later Life um, Project. I think I have abuse in there twice. Um, so the grant got started. The key component of this grant that was written was with some MOU partners as well as um, community partners to try to come together and do some uh, training, uh, cross-training among systems. For example, the law enforcement, the prosecution, the victim service 
systems in order to focus more on the need to bolster services and response to victims of late life abuse. So our project goals, next slide, thank you. Very quickly, um, the grants uh, primary goals were to improve coordination of criminal justice system response in late life abuse using a multidisciplinary, culturally competent and regional response. So we already had many of those components in place, specifically with the DV Regional Council uh, and then with the uh, vulnerable um, vulnerable adult protocols that were already being worked on. So um, again, we were sort of organizing ourselves as a, in a community prior to receiving the grant, but we're also expected to increase the capacity of partners to be effective in holding perpetrators of, uh, accountable and to improve communication coordination uh, in late life abuse across the region and intentionally to be able to expand this as a model statewide. So the next slide gives us information on um, the partners' roles and responsibility. Uh, and I'll be specific about partners at this point, but in general, they're to do what partners do well in collaboration, share expertise, participate in a specific needs assessment that I'll also be addressing in just a moment, to participate in project meetings, which we have been doing regularly since January, uh, to assist in the assessment of protocols and identify areas to improve. Again, we're going to be, Amy's going to be sharing the adult uh, protocols later on in the meeting today. So we've got some of that already in place. And to participate in trainings and develop a train the trainer process. That will be conducted and is, is to be conducted primarily by our federal partners, um, where the different disciplines such as the victim services, the law enforcement and the prosecutors all participate in trainings that the, the federal government will put on um, to give them information to bring back to our community. And then they do a train the trainer from there. And so those are the roles and responsibilities. So who, who have been our primary partners up to this point? And the next slide will indicate who is already part of it. So. Uh, the, the grantee was the Arizona Department of Economic Security, but I'll note primarily because um, MAG was not able to apply for the grant because of their uh, status. Um, and so we offered to apply for it in order to get the money into our community. But this really was a grant that was grown out of the work that MAG was already doing in with the DV Regional Council. The other MOU partners was Maricopa County's Attorney's Office and members of that office have been participating since the very beginning along with the County Sheriff's Office. We have several members of that office participating both in their community uh, police response and in their training division. The Area Agency Aging was written in as an MOU partner and, and part of that was the DOVES program, which um, has been around for a long time and was developed uh, in an attempt to respond to domestic violence and late life abuse. So we already had victim services that were targeted to this population. And then of course, MAG goes without saying. Those were considered the MOU partners that were written into the grant. Um, however, there was many other letters of support from City of Phoenix Police, City of Phoenix Victim Services, the Attorney General's Office with their task force uh, um, against senior abuse, the Intertribal Council signed on to be a partner or and to participate, and then of course our Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence. And that's just to name a few. This is not an exclusive list at all. And we hope to, as the community coordinated response specific to this issue grows, that we'll have other partners joining us. But so far we started first meeting with just the basic MOU partners. We've already expanded the Family Advocacy Center and Phoenix is now uh, attending um, a representative from Adult Protective Services is attending. So our more, community response team is already starting to grow. That's exciting. So we had a, in the next slide, I'll move into what I want to primarily share with you today. Our first major task in, that you'll see on the next slide that 
there <laughs> was to develop a needs assessment. Now, again, this is a very specific requirement by the, the grant that in, in order to determine what best our community needs, that we conduct a needs assessment using uh, surveys, pre prescribed surveys that they had developed. And we were asked to uh, survey both those individuals who were 50 years and older, who either had experience or just had opinion or awareness of late life abuse in terms of what kinds of needs there would be in the community. And then we were also asked to, um, to survey our community partner and the organizations that might interface with people that, um, with individuals that have, uh, have again, awareness or knowledge of late life abuse. So we had two separate survey processes to develop. So the uh, coordinated response team came together and determined who we were gonna survey, the numbers of survey and the process for doing that. Um, as you well know, we had to do that uh, process during um, the, the pandemic and, and our federal partners were well aware of the challenges that would, would um, be, uh, that, that would hold simply because we senior centers were not open and other places where we normally would be able to go and do a surveying process were not available to us. So we developed, and, and I have to say, specifically with the assistance of the Area Agency on Aging, we came up with a plan in the next slide. We'll talk more about that. To do um, paper surveys uh, for the individuals, thinking that handing someone a survey is uh, for that population would might be more effective than trying to develop some other kind of survey tool. So again, with the help of the Area Agency on Aging, they identified that they have uh, uh, Meals on Wheels programs that are administered by the senior center within Maricopa County and the area agency oversees that. So they propose that we print, we print surveys and they would hand them out in an envelope that they could return it to uh, individuals that are receiving these, um, that they're receiving this service. And then they would again collect those within a week or two and return this. Um, and at the time I thought, well, okay, let's see how this works. Well, we handed over at the very first of April, uh, 2,400 print copies of surveys, 400 of those were in Spanish to the area agency. And by the end of, by the beginning of May, the end of that month, we had received uh, 285 with 38 in Spanish. That's a 12% uh, response rate. I don't know if any of you have done surveys in the past, but if you can get 10%, you're doing well. So we were way pleased with that. Um, the, our OVW partners were anticipating maybe we would get 100 at the most, and they had, had, didn't have expectations that we go, would go beyond that. So we went well beyond that. And it was, we were able with the partnership of CPLC, um, uh, Luis Regosa, who's in charge of senior centers to actually hand out uh, surveys in a senior living facility that is located here in central Phoenix or in the west side of Phoenix. The, and with his assistance, we were able to get um, to survey um, our primarily Spanish speaking population to an extent we wouldn't have probably been able to do otherwise. So we were very pleased with that response. Um, the surveys, we were able to manage that a lot more easily. Um, at the MAG staff took the survey tool and turned it in, took the tool and the questions, turned it into a survey monkey. From there, we were able to send it out to, um, to multiple, many, many partners uh, of community organizations. And we received 175 responses from those organizations. Again, that far exceeded our expectations and our federal partners were gonna be happy with 50. So we were very pleased with the response. The uh, top three respondents from the organizations were the aging networks, uh, adult daycare centers. And the, again, these are the the leadership in those organizations that were providing the response and then uh, adult days. Uh, I'm sorry, I repeated that twice. I'm not sure what I intended that one to be, but it was an additional one. Okay, next slide. So what did we find out? We took those surveys and uh, actually a colleague of mine here at DES took all of the um, 
the paper surveys and we put together a spreadsheet and just went through all of those. It was, uh, uh, and looked at all the responses that we got. Um, and then Mag was able to compile um, through the uh, Survey Monkey the um, responses we got from the organizations. Uh, the questions were, again, uh, some of the, there was like an eight page survey. It wasn't small and it wasn't quick. So those that took the time to respond to it really were willing to put forth the effort. A part of the survey asked, had you specifically been um, a victim or experienced uh, abuse either before the age of 50 or after the age of 50. What was interesting that um, was that there was very few of all of those that indicated any kind of known abuse in their life. So that left a question to us of did we broad did we survey such a broad spectrum of individuals or did in fact people don't either wanted to identify because it wasn't comfortable or were not aware, even with the very pointed questions that were in the survey, that they were had in fact experienced that. Those that had were though very clear that they had had abuse in their life. So just some of the demographics, because we part of the survey was to ask demographic information. Of all of our respondees, 50% were white, 20% Hispanic, and 9% black. The ages, you can see, was a range from 60 to 90 plus. Um, majority were 70 to 79, which was a little bit higher in age than I would have expected. I was also surprised by the number of 90 years and over that responded to the survey. Income levels, almost half were at, uh, at $15,000 or less, which is poverty level. So. The next slide will show some of the responses. So one of, there was a whole series of questions. I've just pinpointed some that we felt were the most important in terms of doing the needs assessment. So the three uh, top services they felt were needed if you were going to develop some kind of a response for victims of late life abuse would be to have an advocate or a case manager that they could uh, meet with or talk with, someone that they could spend some time with addressing what some of their issues and concerns were. The next response was also very high across the board was to have some kind of 24 seven helpline. Uh, and then a next one that was fairly high was affordable legal help that came up over and over again. Um, when they were asked uh, how the, what ideally they would want services available and, and no surprise as everybody wanted, uh, pretty much everybody wanted services 24 uh, seven. Location of services, that was also something that was asked. So some of the suggestions they had, so where so services should be located were senior centers, faith-based communities. That was surprisingly high number um, that said faith in faith-based communities is where services could be located. And then of course, area agency on aging. And then another question was basically, what do you want to know? What uh, should we be aware of? And there was knowledge that services are available, uh, information about housing, and then referral to agencies that could get help. So those were the primary um, needs that they thought would be good information to have available for within these services. Next slide. And Amy, if I'm running over on time, just let me know. Um, method to inform the services. So how do you get this information out? There was a whole list of, of options. There was probably 10 options. And in this day and age with everything dr being driven to um, social media or information that's available through the internet, a surprising, the, the results were, maybe not surprising to those, uh, to us a little bit was that people still wanted that paper brochure. They wanted something in their hands or they wanted us to use publications that would be directed to seniors. Those could be newsletters, they could be circulars, something that again, they would pick up someplace and look at. And then television ads, not internet, not Facebook, but television ads were the, so again, I think that's very indicative of the population and how they, how they choose to receive information. Locations of these for those that actually have um, print copies of them to be developed would be again, senior centers, senior housing facilities and congregate living settings. 
Okay, next slide. Um, now, our community stakeholders, what did they say? Interestingly enough, there was a lot of parallels. Their, their first, the most helpful service was again, an advocate or a case manager, about the same number, said that they felt like that was the most important thing from their experience of dealing with the population. Um, obviously, not obviously, but also they felt like some of that uh, money that could be used for rent, moving, medication, some of those essential services that you often don't have funding available quickly to provide for those. And then transitional housing uh, was another response. Um, they felt like the location should also be senior centers, also be senior housing. They also said health care, though, and I, I thought that that was a very important point to make, because where do people go in later life? They, primary, they oftentimes go to health care settings. So. Um, obstacles to providing the services. Um, that to providing services, they were the community surveys were asked that, and they said their obstacles would be resources, limited resources to live independently. And I think we know this across the board, whether it's any kind of services to, to older populations, whether it be related to abuse or not, would be uh, living independently. Fear, shame, and embarrassment, and that definitely with the issues of the very personal and private issues of of late life abuse, that could be a factor. And then limited affordable housing. So where do I, if I wanna get out, if I feel like I have reached a point where I need to make a change in my life, where do I go? Um, and then supports that they felt were needed were accessible facilities, outreach and training for staff. Um, next slide. Okay, so that's that's at the end of the needs assessment. What what we've already done is compiled a, a document that gave a broad overview with all the data um, and sent that to our federal partners. They've already looked at it, said that it's good, and our next step is to create a um, strategic plan to let them know how we're going to take this information, translate it into the types of services or needs in our community, and then um, do a, uh, let them know the resources that we need in order to make that happen. Um, there was in the original grant, there's money budgeted for um, victim service resources, but we had to get to the point of understanding what our community needed in order to to access those resources. So we're in the process now of developing that plan that will be submitted to the federal government and they will accept. Um, we are just about at the end of our first year of this grant. It's gone very fast, but since it's an October one start date, we'll be finishing our first year on September 30th and then moving into the um, second and third year, which will focus a lot on the victim services that we've identified, but also the training of the law enforcement, training of the prosecutors, training of the victim services. To get that all started, and this is my last slide, and then I'll end and take questions. Um, the federal partners have asked that each community develop what they're terming a kickoff event. And this is sort of like a public awareness event. Uh, they will. They are asking us to, it'll be a virtual meeting. They're asking us to pull all the critical partners together. And so all of the members of the, of the regional council, along with our coordinated community response will be invited to attend this kickoff event. Um, it will be, uh, we've given them some priorities of dates that we'd like to have. And our first priority is the end of October so that we can have the event still during the DV Awareness Month. We'll be hearing from them. So they, the federal partners, once we invite everybody and get the event set up, they're gonna come in and manage the meeting and introduce to the community from their perspective what this grant is all about, what they see as the impact to the community. Um, they're going to want to um, give more information on the roles and the expectations of the grant and the community. And as I said, this uh, event will be held hopefully at the end of October, we are waiting to confirm the final date. So that's our next major step in what we're doing in our um, Arizona Abuse and Late Life project. So with that, I'll end and if anybody has any questions, I'll attempt to answer them.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. So I, I do have um, a couple of questions regarding the community response team. Is mm -hmm. that able to grow with additional members? So like a half hour ago, we were talking about the fire department needs to be on board. And I believe uh, Director Mattingly is going to reach out to you. So it's already in the works, DC. Absolutely. How about hospitals? We have, um, we have talked about that. I think definitely there's a need. So it's a matter of finding key people. If you have any suggestions of maybe community liaisons and some of the bigger corporations like Banner that we right. could reach out to, we'd be happy to have those suggestions. Because then um, I actually just got off of a meeting earlier today with uh, the fire department has with the hospital emergency room coordinators, and oh. they might be a great um, group to get involved on that. And when you talk about the fire department um, being part of it, you might specifically want to request um, from the cities any crisis response teams that they have, because we they are completely separated as far as usually okay. the crisis response teams are okay. civilians. But I agree, I think we also need the sworn firefighters to participate in this as well. Well, I was thinking actually it's your, your shop. So, um, so uh, hopefully he knows that. So absolutely. But if you could provide a uh, DC, if you could send me information on this hospital emergency room response, that, that's a wonderful suggestion. Absolutely. I'll, I'll try to get you the list of those individuals as soon as I can. Perfect. Thank you. Are there any other uh, comments or uh, suggestions or questions? None. All right. Thank you, Laura, for your presentation. Um, I'm sorry, unfortunately, my computer went dead on me <laughs> halfway through. So I just got it back on just a few minutes as you were ending. So I missed a lot of it. So hopefully I'll be able to somehow you know, catch what I missed. Uh, but thank you very much. We're committed to working with you and supporting these efforts. And we're proud to partner with you on such important work. Thank you so much. And um, thank, you. thank you for the work that's going to happen in October. We look forward to having more information on that as you get the dates and so forth. Thank, thank you very you. much. Okay. Um, item five. Uh, is going to be on the vulnerable adult protocol update and approval. Jim Seeger joins us today to offer a presentation on the vulnerable adult protocol. He and a team of people have worked diligently to update this important document. We are thankful to Jim and his team for their efforts. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry, I had to have myself muted. Um, Good afternoon to everyone. My name is Jim Seeger. I am a deputy county attorney at the Maricopa County Attorney's Office. I work in the uh, Family Violence Bureau, and I am also the designated vulnerable adult prosecutor uh, point person for the office. I don't do them all, but um, I'm one of the people that handles those. <clears throat> so I'm uh, very pleased to be here today to present uh, the final draft finally of the vulnerable adult protocol. Um, as was mentioned, there is a large uh, number of people that uh, uh, contributed to the update and uh, this final product. And so um, it's, and I'm happy to present it, it vulnerable adult abuse is um, a very large issue and it encompasses, uh, it comes in a lot of different forms. It can be physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse and financial uh, exploitation. And so one of the challenges is that vulnerable adult abuse is largely unreported for a, a whole variety of reasons uh, that are similar to DV. So this council would be aware of that. Um, so because of that, there is, it was identified a need, uh, not only for heightened awareness, but for training of those professionals who uh, in the community who would possibly in encounter vulnerable victims of vulnerable adult abuse. Um, and this document uh, seeks to help those folks, give them a framework and guidelines uh, to follow in, in, uh, in those kinds of cases. Um, so if I could get the next slide. The, the purpose of the protocol is to give those professionals in various different disciplines uh, a framework of best practices 
uh, when they encounter someone who might be a victim of vulnerable adult abuse. And when I say different disciplines, uh, if you, I'm guessing you have access to the document, you'll see that there are a number of different areas from law enforcement, prosecutors, victims' rights advocates, healthcare professionals, um, adult protective services professionals, long-term care ombudsmans. Um, so there, it covers a, a very large uh, universe of people that uh, <clears throat> can use these resources to help folks who are victims of these offenses. Um, and the idea is that this uh, document and these folks will be able to help uh, in the immediate crisis and uh, to ensure safety and, and to resolve crises, the immediate crisis of a victim. Um, but also it helps uh, in the implementation of ongoing safety and security. Also, uh, those professionals who help these victims navigate their way uh, if there's a criminal justice aspect and uh, help them as victims to understand the process and participate in the process. Um, there are guidelines specifically to law enforcement um, and others who, for example, adult protective services who investigate these kinds of offenses to ensure that they're aware of sort of the unique uh, aspects of these types of cases that may not be uh, sort of intuitive or readily apparent uh, for people that investigate other types of crimes. And so the hope is that with this additional knowledge and training, they're able to uh, identify the unique aspects of these types of cases so that they can properly be uh, handled. Also, similarly, the guidelines for uh, prosecution, uh, vulnerable adult abuse cases are a bit different than other types of prosecution. So uh, the idea was to give prosecutors, uh, make them aware of the special circumstances in these types of cases and give them best practices. Uh, to hold offenders accountable. If I could have the next slide, please. <clears throat> so this revision process, uh, it, it was a long one, <laughs> but it was a labor of love. And uh, I know that I see a few fa faces on, on the call today who were involved in this process. And um, this, the, the revision started, I believe, in 2015, so before I was part of the group. And <clears throat> the idea was that we were, we had a protocol that was rather outdated. I believe it was created in 2001. Um, it was referenced to uh, only elder <clears throat> abuse, and which just doesn't track with Arizona statutes. Uh, the statutes recognize vulnerable adults, which is much broader than uh, simply elders. So um, this, the protocol also had rather some outdated and antiquated uh, references and terms like tape recording and things like that. Um, but, uh, and it was also very, it was specific to Maricopa County. It was developed largely by the county attorney's office and made lots of references to things that would be specific to Maricopa County. And so <clears throat> the need was identified and, and the goal was that we would make this a statewide uh, application so that uh, other counties and, and other professionals in other places uh, would be able to uh, use these guidelines and they would be applicable to them, not, and it would be more than just Maricopa County specific. So uh, stakeholders were invited to the group that were more statewide. The Attorney General's office was involved and um, there's, I'll leave people out if I try and list them. So uh, on page three of the protocol is a list of uh, various agencies who were involved, but uh, it was very helpful to have these, um, the input of these stakeholders who uh, brought together um, cultural implications that need to be considered or technological implications. Uh, some areas may not have the same technology as the larger cities. Um, also, the, the areas that deal um, with, with victims and, and vulnerable adults to help understand uh, some of the uh, disabilities or, or capabilities that these folks might have and how you need to address those things. So. Um, it took several years and there were a few pauses and, and people, some people came and some people went from the project, but um, it was uh, a very, very thorough uh, rewrite. And in some sections, for example, the ombudsman section, I believe took a complete rewrite. So uh, the effort was there to, to really make this comprehensive, uh, make it applicable statewide and to cover uh, as many different points as we could think of in handling these types of cases. 
Um, so if I can have the next slide. So what we have uh, for you today is the current edition of the Vulnerable Adult Protocol. And when you look at the table of contents, you'll see the different sections uh, that it is broken into. Uh, and I mentioned a few of them uh, earlier, but you have everything from the law enforcement and prosecution and adult protective services to healthcare professionals who uh, you know, may need to be uh, further trained or have awareness heightened uh, so that they can recognize issues of vulnerable adult abuse. Um, one of the probably most helpful section uh, that I found in the protocol are the appendices. This, um, each of the different areas um, who were the stakeholders were invited to contribute to the appendices. And there are uh, things in there to help the practitioners who are reading the protocol for their section. For example, um, there are checklists for law enforcement, uh, tips on interviewing both victims and uh, alleged perpetrators in these types of cases. There are suggested forms, documents uh, that they can use and, and uh, modify to suit their needs. There are statutory references uh, for quick references to the applicable statutes. Um, there's also links to other services uh, and resources that may be helpful for people trying to help the victims of vulnerable adult abuse. So uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the pro protocol uh, see the, the work that went into it. Um, the, once we have approval from the council, we, I know there is a scheduled uh, sort of rollout or introduction of the protocol that will be done uh, through the Arizona Prosecutors Advisory Council, APAC, and that is coming up soon. Um, and then lastly, the last slide, I just wanted to recognize again, um, all the dedicated professionals who really uh, took the time to make this possible. I know that uh, many people uh, in, in this revision process were working on this in their off hours, making very detailed comments and, and research to make sure that we have a very best product uh, that we could present and, and we think we have that. So uh, many thanks to those who participated to this. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions, but otherwise that's the overview of the vulnerable adult. Jim, thank you so much for that presentation. Lori, do you have a question on that? Just um, related to Mr. Seeger's comment about APAC going to do a presentation on this, will the council members be notified of that so that, or be able to uh, join that? The podcast? When APAC does their presentation of the protocols. Uh, yes, we would be happy to, um, to share that information with you. Okay, good. Absolutely. Any other questions? I believe uh, Matt, our Madam Chair, uh, Councilmember Norton was um, dropped. Uh, her computer dropped the connection again. Um, Vice Chair Ernst, are you wanting to step in or, or do you want me to keep the meeting going? Um, Amy wanted to go ahead and keep the meeting going. Okay, great, Thank you. absolutely not a problem. This item is scheduled for action. Is, is there anyone wanting to motion, um, to offer a motion to approve the vulnerable adult protocol in this revision? Yes, this is Vanden, thank you. This is DCL oh. second. So moved. <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, we have a motion from Council uh, Member Vanden and a second from our Vice Chair Ernst. Is there any discussion? Does not seem to be the case. Um, Tina, will you please call the roll call? Thank you, Amy. Zach Altman. Aye. Thank you. Council Member Lupe Vanden. Aye. Thank you. Council Member Tammy Kabuti. Aye. Thank you. Council Member Christine Ellis. Yes. Thank you. Dolores DC Ernst. Thank you. Council member Jerry Fidel. Aye. Thank you. Laura Guild. Yes. Thank you. Elizabeth Herbert. Yes. Thank you. Samantha Hitchie. Aye. Thank you. Uh, Patricia Clark. 
Aye. Thank you. Mary Lynn. Kassinick. Kassinick. Aye. Thank you very much. Andy uh, Lafier. Aye. Thank you. And council member Anita Norton, are you on? I just got back on. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. How I do you vote? Uh, yes. Thank you. Welcome back. Amy Offenberg. Amy, are you on? Okay. Geraldo Pena. Thank you. Mayor Bridget Peterson. Yes. Thank you. Chris Charlo. Yes. Thank you. And Sergeant Kelly Shore. Yes. Thank you. Melissa Thomas. Melissa Thomas. Okay. And Brandon Wilson. Yes. Thank you. And that's it. Amy, you may proceed or Chair Norton. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. I'm sorry. Um, my computer has died twice during this, so now I'm on the phone. I'm only getting audio, so I can't see any of the presentations from this point. Um, but I'd like to uh, thank you. The, adult, the Vulnerable Adult Protocol is now approved. Jim, thank you very much to you and the Maricopa County Attorney's Office for your leadership on this. We are reaching out to statewide groups like the Arizona Prosecuting Attorneys Association, or APAAC, and the Task Force Against Senior Abuse for their endorsement of the protocol. APAAC has graciously invited us to present the protocol on one of their podcasts as well. Developing the protocol was a significant undertaking, and we now need to promote the protocol and share it widely. We um, now are going to continue on with Bloom 365. Uh, and I'm pleased to introduce Donna Bartos, founder and CEO of Bloom 365, to, an, to offer an update on their efforts to protect youth and prevent interpersonal violence. Donna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Council Member Norton, and to the whole council for having me back. I think it's been a couple of years, so I'm excited to share with you what Bloom 365 has been up to and how we've been blooming despite the pandemic. I'm gonna turn my video off so I can um, concentrate on these slides here. And um, I have 10 minutes, so I'm gonna talk wicked fast, but uh, my contact information will be shared at the end if you have any questions, comments. Um, I'm gonna be sharing lots of information and drop, um, dropping a lot of information here. So at Bloom 365, our mission is to prevent teen dating abuse before it starts. Our vision, next slide, is safe and healthy relationships for all. And we do this work under the brand promise, next slide please, of bringing love on others more 365 days a year. That's what Bloom 365 stands for. The B, the L, the O, the O, the M stands for bring love on others more 365 days a year. You will see QR codes throughout this presentation. This presentation, I understand, will be uploaded on the website as well. So if there's more information that you want, um, I encourage you to snap that QR code and take a look. Um, this one here is regarding our founding story, how we got started, why we exist. Next slide, please. And so we have some significant objectives against those mission and vision points, mainly to one, teach healthy relationship skills early and often increase help seeking and safety and healing among young people who have experienced or witnessed victimization, interrupt violence in its tracks for young people who recognize as a result of our work that they themselves are at risk for or are already controlling abusive or violent, as well as promote social norms that protect against violence, that is our community engagement work, and most importantly, creating protective environments for young people, primarily with our school-based work. Next slide, please. Our target audiences are youth and teens, ages 11 to 17 years old, and how we reach them is through school-based work. About 80% of our work is school-based. Last year, um, most of our work, of course, like most, was online, but we're looking forward to getting back into schools next week. 
Um, also community-based in partnership with community-based organizations and again, virtual program delivery. Our other target audience is young adults between the ages of 18 to 24 years old and our outreach efforts there are on college campuses and workplaces and again, online. And we can't uproot abuse in a generation um, without making sure that the trusted adults in the lives of young people also know how to respond to these issues, what to do, what not to do, what to say, what not to say. So we also engage individuals, parents and caregivers, whole communities, school personnel, churches, workplaces, teams and systems, military law enforcement, justice, media, et cetera, in this work to prevent teen dating abuse before it starts, which encompassing, encompasses all forms of interpersonal violence. Next slide, please. So some of the statistics by the numbers, I'm gonna share a slide here regarding um, some national stats. So for those of you who are familiar with teen dating violence, you may have heard the statistic, one in three teens report experiencing dating abuse. Through our research and looking at other surveys that have been done, we found, next slide please, that 60% of teens nationally report experiencing teen dating violence and one in 11 or only 9% of teens who have experienced victimization would seek formal help from an adult after that victimization. Locally, we know, you can go ahead to the next slide, please, that this is not just an adult problem. In Arizona, between 2008 and May 31st, 2021, and sadly, there may be more statistics here since May 31st, there are 1,429 domestic violence-related deaths in Arizona. Of these tragedies, 193 of the victims were under the age of 18, and 66 of the victims under the age of 24 were killed by a current or former intimate partner. This information comes from the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence Fatality Report. Um, our numbers that we're seeing as we reach young people has been trending since 2012, 2013 with uh, students and teens primarily anonymously disclosing that 50% of them have been impacted by some form of dating violence or domestic violence victimization. And also about 29% of young people that we reach disclose that they themselves have perpetrated an act of dating abuse. So we know that this problem does not, uh, is not only uh, focused on adults. Next slide, please. So what do we do in response to these statistics and to meet our mission and vision? Our work revolves around school and community-based prevention and response. Next slide, please. Everything that we do is focused on this prevention pipeline. If you're familiar with how prevention works, there's primary prevention, preventing violence before it begin, begins. There's secondary prevention, interrupting violence in its tracks, stopping it before continued harm happens, and then tertiary healing after victimization. And our strategies, which you're gonna learn about now, cover the entire prevention pipeline. We are fully comprehensive in how we do our work. Next slide, please. So with our prevention and response strategies, we do five things. We educate young people, again, between the ages of 11 and 24 regarding what's healthy, what's unhealthy, what the red flags are, the warning signs, how to get help, how to help a friend, how to resolve conflicts, how to communicate, how to ask for consent, how to respect boundaries, um, what the root causes are so that they know how to prevent it. And most importantly, how to change culture and build a culture of empathy, respect, and consent peer to peer so that we can truly uproot abuse in Gen Z. That involves a seven dose curriculum for high school students, a five dose curriculum for middle school students, and then for schools and community organizations that can't comprehensively implement our research-based curriculum, we offer single flash dose lesson lessons. And of course, we are more than happy to pop up outreach and resource fair tables to reach young people. In 2020 21, our fiscal year, which ended June 30th, 2,454 students went through our online curriculum compared to 2019 to 2020 when we were in doing our school-based work of 4,008 students going through our curriculum. So we definitely did see a dip for not being able to be on campuses. And those campuses that we typically, and schools that we typically partner with, um, did not bring us back online because they were dealing with so much, just trying to navigate meeting those core standards in a very um, stressful time. So we're really looking forward next week to getting back into the groove um, on site with all of our COVID protocols in place. The exciting thing about our education work um, that's been funded over the years by VOCA and then this year new STOP 
uh, as well as ADHS, is we are now modifying our curriculum so that it is fully universal for young people with disabilities. And we've built some significant partnerships with Special Olympics Arizona, Excel, um, Diverse Ability Incorporated, and some other, other organizations that serve young people with varying disabilities and abilities to make sure that our curriculum is relevant for them as well. For our advocacy work, this is the, the part of our work where we are serving young people who've experienced victimization, providing safety planning, crisis counseling, peer support groups, individual counseling, in-person, online, and mobily in school and community-based organizations across the Valley. In our fiscal year 2020-21, um, we served 86 young people who've experienced victimization directly, responded to hundreds of anonymous disclosures of abu abuse, Comparatively, 2019 to 2020, we served 235 young people directly. So what we're finding here is that when we are able to be in person in a classroom with students, we are able to build trust. And that is a gift in the work that we do. It's very difficult to build trust with young people who don't reach out for help anyway while trying to do it virtually. We did our best, but again, we really look forward to getting back in person. The next layer of our work is to activate young people to get to that peer-to-peer -peer culture changing work that we wanna see. So we have a three time a year peer advocate academy where young people are trained up on how to do this work peer-to-peer, -peer, how to recognize the signs, how to respond in a way that does not put them into a position where they're their friend's counselor or therapist, but how they can um, safely recommend and refer um, resources to friends who might be experiencing abuse or violence, as well as our peer advocate crew clubs on school campuses, our first Friday campaigns, which you'll learn about in a minute. And then our elephant in the room talks. These are those elephant in the room conversations that we have quarterly with students so that they can let us know this is what's going on. These are the topics that are hard to talk about as it relates to interpersonal violence prevention and healthy relationship promotion. And this is how the adults in our lives can help us circumvent these issues. So truly youth-centered, youth-led, and youth-informed. Currently we have 80, 80, volunteer lead peer advocates. Um, that is because of our outstanding uh, former VISTA, who is now our volunteer coordinator, Allison Orr. Over the pandemic year, she, she hit the ground running and figured out how to recruit young people as lead peer advocates who are trained up in their school communities to do this work. So we're really excited about that continued growth. Next slide, please. And the other two layers of our work are intervention or intervene services. So as I mentioned, there are young people who go through our curriculum who as a result of that curriculum say, hey, that's me, I'm experiencing this. And we know with victim services funding that you can't typically serve perpetrators. So we got to work and found resources through Dignity Health, a, a Dignity Health ongoing grant so that we could create the first known individual counseling, group counseling and risk assessment program to reach young people who might be on threat assessments um, for schools, those kiddos that are getting kicked out of school because of aggressive behavior, and then there's no follow-up. Also for young people who self-refer as a result of going through our education programs, and then young people who may be referred by parents, guardians, school social workers, other youth service providers that are in their lives who recognize the risk factors are there, the protective factors are missing, and they need some extra help. The cool thing about our intervention program is we don't do it alone. We don't do any of this work alone. But the one thing that's most exciting is that school district by school district, we're building school-based coordinated community response teams to make sure that we have a multidisciplinary response when it comes to intervening, when it comes to inter interrupting violence for young people that are at risk or are already perpetrating. So that involves school stu uh, student support staff, school resource officers, local behavioral health providers, students themselves to provide that informational lens that we need to make sure that our interventions are relevant. Um, so you will see more and hear more about those CCRTs coming up in the next year as they start to take root, thanks to our funding from Dignity and thanks to our funding from STOP, because part of those CCTs are to ensure victim safety. And then finally, train. We can't go into schools and train young people how to recognize these signs and encourage them to go out and find their trusted adult if ever, anything ever happens and let their trusted adult know, and then their trusted adult not knowing what to say. So we've developed a trusted adult ally three R's training. It is comprehensive. It is not a shot in the arm, one hour workshop. This is fully intensive. And at the end, school personnel, parents, caregivers, youth service providers, school resource officers, anybody interacting with young people know how to recognize the signs from a, from a youth centered lens, 
know how to respond in the way young people want them to respond and know how to reframe this and reinforce this so that we truly can uproot abuse in a generation. All five of these strategies are research-based, youth-centered, trauma-informed, measured, inclusive, and now available in person and online. Uh, we did train last year um, online. The online piece helped us here, 189 trusted adult allies virtually. Um, so we're really thrilled about the promise of that. That is the only thing that there's a fee for service for. That is our earned revenue strategy. And that long-term is going to be our sustainability and our scalability strategy. Next slide, please. So all of these strategies, collectively, we aim to reach our BHAG 2030. That is our big, hairy, audacious goal. By the year 2030, we want to educate and activate a minimum of 10% school students across Arizona to get to the tipping point. So our big goal by 2030 is that 110,000 Arizona, primarily high school students are educated and activated to do this work peer to peer. If you know anything about the tipping point theory of change, you know that all it takes 10% is for something to stick. If you don't know about it, I encourage you to check it out and uh, maybe think back to this presentation about how simplistically we're trying to address and tackle a very complex problem. Next slide, please. In addition to that, our big carry audacious goal by 2030 is to train 4.7 million youth across the country on how to uproot abuse in their generation. So through that, we are training others to facilitate our strategies in communities across the country. We just received a request today actually to do some global blooming um, to bring this work to a community in Uganda. So we are starting to scale um, organically. Next slide, please. And our BHAG 2030 as it relates to the trusted adults in their lives. Here in Arizona, there are approximately, and I don't know if these points are accurate now given what's going on in the education system, but um, 59,794 public school teachers, that tipping point to ensure that 10% are trained how to recognize, respond, and reframe is 5,979. These are our big goals that we are aiming to achieve in the next nine months. Nine, nine and, well, nine and what? A quarter years. Next slide, please. So how do we do all this work? We don't do it alone. Our 2021, 2022 major funding sources are through VOCA, the Governor's Office of Youth, Faith and Family Stop and SAS programs. That SAS grant is really enabling us to expand and grow our outreach advocacy and intervention services for young people with disabilities and individuals and adults with disabilities by partnering with the Excel school community. So we're just getting started there and look forward to sharing those results next year. And then an ADHS SVF PEP grant and then our Dignity Health Grant for intervention. So those are our major funding sources. And of course, we're funded by the generosity of individuals and special events and our earned revenue strategies. Next slide, please. You will see here, for those of you who've known me a while and, and have heard me speak before at these MAG meetings, even pre-2014, you'll know that up until 2014, we were a 100% volunteer-led, volunteer-driven organization. We have grown tremendously by then. This will be the year that we hit the $1 million budget mark. Um, it's exciting and scary at the same time because as we're scaling and growing fast, our capacity is not keeping up with that. So currently we're looking for some infrastructure partners to help us there. But just so you know, on the staff end, we went from zero to 14 paid staff. We now have five part-time staff, nine full-time staff, working on hiring some more, two contracted clinical supervisors, an LCSW and an LPC, six to 12 interns, depending upon the semester, and 20 paid high school lead peer advocates in their school communities doing this. And we're scaling that to 30 this year with the generosity of some extra funding. We have nine board members. We're also looking to grow there. So if anybody's interested in serving on our board, please let me know. And again, I can't reiterate enough that this funding now has enabled us to address the social determinants of health and the inequities as it relates to domestic sexual teen dating violence prevention and response among LGBTQ youth, as well as youth with disabilities. Next slide, please. So that was a little bit of our impact. If you'd like to know more about our impact, you can check out our website. And on one of these slides here, there was a QR code that um, referenced FAQs or frequently asked questions. The best way to feel the impact of our work is to check out the elephant in the room, frequently asked questions from young people who go through our curriculum. It might be an eye opener to you, maybe not, 
But that's where we really hone in and listen to and understand what the trends are and how we need to respond. Next slide, please. This is just a quick list of where we're meeting young people. We're meeting them in schools and communities online. Some of the districts, we have MOU or Memorandum of Understanding Agreements. Some we have cooperative agreements that if one district approved all of our five strategies, that means other districts that are involved in that cooperative agreement also have the opportunity to bring us in. So we're really excited about that. Again, last year delayed some of this, but we're back on track. Some charter and private schools, community-based partners. Our community-based partners is really where we provide those direct victim advocacy services and those intervention services. And of course, college campuses, now not only in Arizona, but because of our lead peer advocate program, we now have peer advocates at Stanford, Harvard, and more. So we're super excited about that. And then next slide, please. So how can you help? How can you join us? There's a few ways that um, the council can help us just continue to make sure that young people are heard, that young people experiencing, witnessing, or perpetrating victimization have access to youth-centered, relevant, free and confidential services. So um, the best thing that you can do is to refer, next slide please, young people to our advocacy and intervention services, our individual and group services, again, ages 11 to 24. Next slide please. We have our 888-606-HOPE helpline. This is a text and chat line. Uh, right now, the hours are Monday through Friday from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. That's an area where we need to increase our capacity for staffing and hold later hours and weekend hours to truly meet young people where they're at. Um, but right now, those are the hours of that line. They can text or call that number or go on our website, bloom365.org, and chat for services. We provide safety planning, crisis counseling, peer support activities, individual counseling, group counseling. We just became licensed by ADHS as a licensed counseling agency. So now we are going to work through all the paperwork to figure out how to become an access provider. I understand it's a bear, but we're ready for it. Um, and then also help with talking with parents and guardians, school counselors and trusted adults in their lives and resource connections to meet basic needs. Next slide, please. In addition, we know October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, February is Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So another way to support our work and get involved and to support the lead peer advocates who are working so hard in their campus communities to uproot abuse in their generation is to participate in our First Friday campaigns. Next slide, please. What it is is simply is to join our lead peer advocates to kick off these awareness campaigns the first Friday of the month by wearing purple. Uh, October 1st is the first Friday this year. So go purple that day to raise awareness, validate survivors, especially young survivors, show your support and start sparking those conversations without saying a word. And you'll see here, uh, February for Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, we're gonna go orange the first Friday of February, February 4th. And April 1st, we're gonna go teal the first Friday in April for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. So please join us to rep the movement. Our t-shirts will be on sale on our website in a couple of weeks. Um, so they're really cool and people really love them. Uh, next slide, please. In addition, since Arizona schools end in May, our peer advocates do some summer virtual First Friday campaigns. Uh, they go rainbow during LGBTQ plus Pride Month. Uh, next year, 2022, it'll be June 3rd. And this year uh, started to uh, promote and, and do some really cool social media outreach regarding Disability Pride Month to just inform folks um, that we need to make sure that we are all inclusive and include individuals with disabilities in this conversation. Next slide, please. Another way to raise awareness, if you are in a workplace or a place where you might have foot traffic, um, we have adopted the National Silent Witness Exhibit. Um, we've done it a little bit differently where our silent witnesses created by the students at Excel um, are silhouettes of young people between the ages of 13 and 24 whose lives were taken by an act of dating or domestic violence. These are three of the young people whose stories we remember and whose names we honor, Becky Casper, age 19, Kiana Bergman, age 19, and Andrew Aranda, age 22. And if you're interested in that, again, you can reach out and we'd be happy, well, not happy, but it's a powerful exhibit. Um, and unfortunately, people gravitate to the wilting stuff more than the blooming stuff to raise awareness. So um, we have these silhouettes with permission from their families um, to share their story and to help increase awareness. I'm almost done, I promise. Okay, next slide, please. And if that isn't enough and you're super inspired and wanna do more, I encourage you to get trained. 
if you're an adult who interacts with young people or even not, our training truly goes into the deepness of the research behind risk factors, protective factors, root causes, social um, determinants of health, the socioecological model, all the research base out there that is good violence prevention work. We've taken research and theory and we've put it into practice with practical tools and skills that anybody can use when responding to these issues. And if you have young people in your lives, we have our Peer Advocate Academy. Next slide, please. So you'll see here the QR code. If you're interested in that, you can go ahead and, and find this PowerPoint online and snap that QR code and hopefully it'll take you to the registration registration page for upcoming Trust Adult Ally training, which is our three R's. Next slide. Again, recognize, respond, and reframe. Next slide, please. We also have our seven dose facilitator training coming up. This is the first time ever that we've received funding, a grant from ADHS to be able to scale our curriculum across the state of Arizona. Our main goal is to train and partner with one domestic or sexual violence um, prevention and response organization in each county across the state to work together to build community, to facilitate this education in a streamlined standardized way so that together we can learn how we're moving the needle to prevent interpersonal violence among Gen Z. Next slide, please. And then here are just some slides regarding our upcoming peer advocate trainings. If you have a young person in your life, they might be interested in our No Means No conference or summit, which is, uh, next slide, please, which currently is, is still in person. We're gonna make that decision tomorrow if we're gonna go online. Right now it's scheduled for October 2nd at the Glendale Civic Center. It's an all day sexual violence prevention youth summit for young people ages 13 and up or 13 to uh, 18, as well as the trusted adult in their lives. So we'll have parent and caregiver and adult tracks as well. Next slide, please. And then finally, we are thrilled to partner once again with the National Organization for Victim Assistance and their national training conference. We'll be running our 2021 Peer Advocate Academy in Orlando, September 12th through 14th. So if any of you are going to Nova and are bringing a young person with you because it's in Orlando, uh, we would love for them to join us. This is a free training. And again, everything that I've shared here is free, confidential, with the accept exception of our Trusted Adult Ally training. Next slide, please. My contact information is there for you. And final slide. Thank you so much for this time today. Um, I hope I didn't uh, fire hose you with too much information, but remember, we all have a choice to make to bring love on others more 365 days a year. Thank you, Donna, so much. That was uh, very informative, a lot of information. I think uh, we'll definitely have to go back through the slides. I know I have to because I lost my video on this. Um, we look forward to working with you and supporting your efforts uh, in this endeavor and hearing from you further. Um, are, are there, is there anyone out there that would like to have questions or uh, discuss any of the uh, um, um, format that Donna presented today. Hey, it's DC again. Um, <clears throat> Donna, I want I appreciate you coming back in and providing us this update. The last time you presented, the thing that stuck with me the most was when you talked about um, individuals who came to you as in identifying as a perpetrator and that you guys were struggling to find them resources. So great job at building that for them as well. And I look forward to hopefully, hopefully building a partnership with you and our crisis response team to help our, our youth that are in crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, DC. Is there anyone else that has um, any comments or questions? Uh, this is um, Scottsdale City Councilwoman Tammy Caputi. I'd like to make a comment. Please go ahead, Tammy. Okay. Donna, I, I mean, uh, we know each other from way back, and I just wanted to thank you. That was an amazing presentation. I have um, three, three young daughters myself, a few of them who've gone through your program uh, through our temple, and I, I just can't say enough good things about them. Um, it's interesting watching this presentation right after hearing about a presentation um, in terms of vulnerable adults. And I, I can't say strongly enough that I appreciate so much this holistic approach to domestic violence, that it's not just necessarily treating the victims, it's about changing the culture, <laughs> which we all know, but we seem to forget. And so I, I just can't be supportive enough of this approach of 
sort of, you know, from the, from the beginning to the end, not just standing downstream, catching the end result, but getting out in front of it and preventing uh, the behavior right from the start and towards both genders, you know, making sure that there's awareness so that we can prevent things in the future. So great job. Keep it up. I, I would you. love to support you however I can. Well, we'll do coffee at some point. It's nice to see you again. Awesome. Thank you. You too. Um, this, uh, daughter, this is Mary Lynn, and I work, of course, in the field of aging and with the DOMS program. And so we're treating, you know, victims, survivors of lifelong domestic violence, people 50 and over. And I think it's really great to start so early um, with teaching young children how to prevent and respond to abusive relationships because as Tammy said, we've got to start this um, cycle early um, as opposed to waiting until treating a victim who's had 20, 30, 40 years of, of being a victim of domestic violence. So congratulations. And I'm going to share your information with some friends of mine that have teenage uh, children. So thank you. Thank you. Agreed. Um, Donna, I would like to um, ask you a question. I know you said you're going back into the schools. Um, is it later this month or in September? And the question I have is with COVID, um, how are you able, you know, how are the schools that you're going back into approaching this? Um, I think in the past you've done it somewhat like assemblies. Um, what's the approach now with uh, the um, COVID-19 and the variants? How are you able to approach it? Well, thanks for that question. So how we run our, our comprehensive curriculum is we embed right into health education or PE classes. So we essentially are the instructors from period one through period eight. So instead of the health teacher teaching that lesson that day, we're teaching our seven dose curriculum in high schools. Um, so how we're approaching it is we're going into schools right now that are booked where mask policies are mandated. Our staff will be masked up. We will, we will follow all the distancing protocols as much as possible until they say they're virtual. We're going to go in. The majority of our staff have been vaccinated and we know, I know we still don't know what's what with this, right? So um, we're just going to be safe. And the one thing that motivates all of us at our organization is we saw the decline in providing service to young people who needed it by only being able to provide virtual services. And like I mentioned, building trust is so important when you're working with teens. Mm -hmm. And so we are gonna do our best to get back in there and build trust so that um, you know schools are safe places and they've been out of school and detached. So um, we're committed to that, and, but we're also committed to being safe. Right, okay, thank you very much. Um, Madam Chair, this is Council Member Christine Ellis here in Chandler. Uh, may, may I ask a question of Ms. Donna? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Donna, is there, is there a way that we can have access to this presentation? I mean, you were, you were going really well and uh, great and fast, but I didn't have a chance to assimilate some of the information, which is really great information right now for a uh, different segment of populations. And so I would love to be able to digest it a little bit more. Yes, Amy, I believe it's going to be on your website, right? That is correct. Thank you. And I'm happy to email you, Council Member Ellis, um, you know, offline with the presentation and some supplementary materials too, if you'd like. Please do. I would really appreciate that. And maybe we will have a chance to chat. Hi, Donna. I also have a question. I'm wondering if you've had any interaction with the uh, court appointed special advocate program for foster youth. And if this training has been offered to those who become CASA volunteers. Hi again, Kelly. No, um, not yet, but we, we are just getting into the, to the knocking on doors of DCS and some others who are, you know, engaging with young people um, who are in group homes or in the foster um, community. So if you have any inroads there with CASA, would love, um, would love that introduction. I think that would be, I think this training would be really useful and I'd be happy to follow up with you on that. Thank you. Great to connect again. Are there any other uh, comments or questions? 
Okay. If not, uh, again, I'd like to thank you, Donna, for an excellent presentation, lots of information. And I, I have to um, say thank you so much for the work you guys are doing and the expansion of your program. Um, very um, wide reaching all the areas and um, very important. I'm so glad that we have you here and um, also able to share with us and work with us in this area. So thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Okay, with that, um, we will go on to action item number seven, which is uh, regarding Domestic Violence Awareness Month, which is the month of October. This council has hosted press events in the past to promote October as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We have heard two presentations today on older adults and abuse. For this year's press event, we would like to highlight these two important activities and the issue of older adults and abuse in general. Amy St. Peter and Kelly Williams join us today to talk about plans that are underway for the press event and to invite comments from the council. Uh, Kelly and Amy? Great, thank you so much, Madam Chair, members of the council. I can start the presentation and I, and I, and I encourage Kelly to, um, to jump in as well. We are very excited to be able to discuss these plans with you for a press event to highlight October as, as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We're eager for your feedback and for your direction today. Last year, because of the pandemic, in, in lieu of having an in-person event, we instead developed um, a page on our website that offered really great materials about orders of protection. This year, we're hopeful that we'll be able to offer this event in person again, and hopefully with an audience. We will be monitoring very closely the transmission rates for COVID-19, including the Delta variant. We'll, um, we're also planning to have um, different, different precautions in place as well to keep people safe if we are able to have this event in person with an audience. Those precautions include holding this event outdoors, encouraging um, the attendees to wear masks and to physically distance. And so we're hopeful to be able to offer this and to invite you to the event. It is scheduled for September 28th at 10 a.m. Please do have that on your calendars. I want to thank you, Madam Chair, for speaking at the event. We've also confirmed Mayor Giles from Mesa as chair of our MAG Regional Council. We've confirmed um, Maricopa County Attorney Alistair Adele as well. And we're working with Dubs right now to confirm a survivor, an older adult who's been through abuse um, at the hands of her spouse for many years and suffered a variety of different kinds of abuse. She's in a safe place now and is willing to, um, to, to share her story with us. And so we're really hopeful to be able to confirm that very soon and to help humanize this issue for folks who may not have um, direct experience or exposure given their work in the field. As, as the chair said, the focus this year is on older adults. We're very excited to be able to highlight the vulnerable adult protocol. Thank you so much for your positive vote on that earlier, as well as the Arizona Abuse and Later Life projects. I do want to acknowledge the, the partners of, of, the, of the latter project who have joined us here today. I want to thank you for being able to work with you on, on this important work. Also like to thank our other partners for a specific to the press event itself. That includes ACES DB, APAC, DES, Dubs, and Maricopa County Attorney's Office. We hope to have your partnership in terms of your feedback. We're also hopeful that you might be able to share with us any data that's related to domestic violence in general or specifically to older adults. We will be organizing the calendar again this year. And so if you have any information on events, activities that you're planning within your organization or your community, please do let us know. We would be happy to include that on the regional calendar. We have requested permission to have this event outside at the Domestic Violence Memorial that's located on the, on the State Capitol lawn, and we hope to be able to confirm that soon and to get a safe date out to you. Again, we will be closely monitoring those transmission rates to ensure that we can have this event in person, and we hope to be able to, to have you there. We will be um, live streaming the event, so if you're not able to or not comfortable joining us in person, you will absolutely be able to, to see the entire event and to see all the great speakers that we've been able to, to share with you. That concludes um, my comments. I encourage Kelly to jump in with anything else. This, I, this item is for information and for discussion. We're eager to have any questions or any ideas that you might want to share at this time. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, back to you. Or I'd like to open it up to the floor then to members of the, of the Regional Domestic Violence Council for any questions or ideas that you might have at this time. Okay. 
Thank you so very much. We will have information going out to you very soon. Um, Madam Chair, are you are you still on? I see you, but you're on mute. There you go. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, thank you. And so do we not have any further comments about the um, upcoming event or uh, additional suggestions? I don't no. believe there are any at this time. Um, we encourage everyone to reach out to us individually after this meeting if, if there are questions or ideas. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, thanks, Kelly and Amy, for uh, presenting on that and for uh, basically organizing the event, uh, gathering the speakers. I look forward to it. I'm excited to speak at the event and raise awareness about the vital work underway to address abuse, um, both teen dating violence, elder abuse, uh, you know, vulnerable adults, um, domestic violence in general. Um, Please, uh, I would like to encourage all of the members to uh, send the information uh, about the event that's happening also uh, within your city so that others can be aware of it. Uh, I'm not sure as far as attendance in person, but it will be live streamed. So uh, we would encourage as many as possible to be able to be aware of it and get some of the vital information that will be shared. And then also let us know about other activities that you have planned in your own cities uh, and towns uh, for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And you can send that information to Tina. Um, we'll go on now to uh, B, uh, request for future agenda items. Uh, are there any requests from any of the members for future agenda items, topics of interest to the council? Madam Chair, this is Andy from the Criminal Justice Commission. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed on the minutes uh, from the last meeting that there was a request for an update on the AZ point system. So um, I would be happy to work with the MAG staff on coordinating that for the next meeting. Okay, that would be great. We'd look forward to that. Thank you. Any other uh, comments or suggestions? Okay, uh, that being none, uh, comments from the council. Members are provided an opportunity to share information and updates for information. This item is for information only. Any action proposed will be slated for a future meeting. Um, so if, if there's anything that any of you would like to share that's going on within your city, uh, and uh, please, please um, state your name and tell us what it is. Madam Chair, this is Andy. I have one item I'd be happy to update the members on. Please, we welcome that. Thank you, Andy. Um, so I, I believe I had mentioned at a previous meeting or two ago that we had um, put in for and received a grant, um, I believe under VOCA for older, um, older adults as well. It was uh, two years ago now. It was to bring an uh, uh, automated victim notification system into Arizona for the Department of Corrections and Jails. So. Um, something that uh, folks could um, sign up for to get notifications when folks are coming in and out of facilities. Um, we finally have gotten through the procurement process and that project should begin in the next few months. And we will, I believe Maricopa County is gonna be our first county to come online. So once, once, we, that, once that starts to happen, I'll have a little bit more to report, but I, I know that that was of interest to the members when I brought it up before, um, it's uh, unfortunately just taken us a little longer to get through the process, but um, I believe we may be doing some informational meetings on it. And if uh, I am, if I become aware of when those are, I'll certainly reach out to, to Amy and let her know and see if that's something that the folks may want to uh, jump on the, the call and listen into. So uh, I will let, let you all know if, once I know more of that, but we're excited to bring that online and think that that will be a great um, valuable resource not only to folks that have been victims but also to our service providers that are still doing stuff very much in a picking up the phone and calling folks and hopefully allowing those folks to concentrate more on providing direct services to victims instead of making phone calls all day long. Thank you Andy. Um, you know with that and it's it's interesting I think for a long time at least for myself um, I think many of us have thought that there has already been a system in place that would notify victims of this, but um, based on what you're saying, it's not been an organized system. It's been more that of 
maybe an individual person who may have made those calls, but maybe not. Is that correct? Um, I, I, uh, Madam Chair and members, I, I, I believe, and again, this is not my area of expertise. I believe it is, it is certainly something that is required under our constitution and victims' rights that victims be notified. I just believe it's been very much a process that has been done by individuals. Um, so the jails all have people that do it. Our Department of Corrections have staff that do it. Um, we're just trying to bring a technology solution to play that mm -hmm. will allow that to be more efficient and effective, hopefully. So um, victims or folks that are looking for that notification, you know, the system would automatically generate a call, an email or a text, mm -hmm. depending on which they say would be the easiest way to notify them when there is a change in offender status. Right. That'll be uh, really vital information. I think um, that could even be, in some cases, life-saving information to be passed on in a timely manner. So thank you, and please keep us updated on that. Any other uh, comments or suggestions? Okay. If none, uh, I would like to again thank all of the speakers uh, for some very, very good information for us. Um, and I encourage you all to try to attend the press event um, and uh, either in person or online uh, through the, um, I guess, the live streaming. Is that is the live streaming going to be through uh, Facebook or how is that done, uh, Amy? Madam Chair, members of the council, yes, the live streaming will, will be through Facebook. We'll have information about that when the Save the Date goes out soon. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank All right. You. And then with that, um, I'm going to call for adjournment. Um, thanks for attending today. Stay tuned for more details about the press event and the Domestic Violence Awareness Month calendar. Thank you all. Have a great day.